week's colloquium, it is my pleasure to announce Professor Ken Brown from Duke University, who's giving this week's talk. Uh, Ken uh, embodies the interdisciplinary spirit of quantum information. He holds professorships in electrical engineering, chemistry, and physics, and also his research spans theory, uh, experiment, and hopefully he'll tell us about uh, a good swath of it today. Uh, and thank you, and take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm originally from Washington. Uh, I've been in exile for so long, I now usually say Washington State. And every time I say it, it really makes me sad. So it's great to be back to my home state. Uh, I'm at Duke. Uh, Duke was built in the 1920s and pretends to look very old. Um, and I'm also a science advisor for this startup company, INQ. OK, uh, the next thing is. I do love questions, so you can just ask questions anytime. I'm happy. I don't. I have no desire to get through my slides. Okay. All right. So what's a quantum computer? So we're going to take like a big picture approach to this. So we're just going to think about a quantum computer as basically a type of accelerator, which is capable of processing information using the rules of quantum mechanics. All right. So when we take that approach. Um, we can think about wh what goes into building a quantum computer. And I really like this 2019 National Academies report on quantum computing. Uh, I recommend, if you're interested, taking a look. And from, say, an electrical engineering perspective and computer engineering perspective, what you see is it's just all a lot of classical computer engineering, cloud, you know, scopes, RF sources. And then only at the very bottom is there anything that's quantum mechanical. So if you're going to build a quantum computer, you really have to get all of this um, classical engineering to work. So once we've built this uh, quantum computer, what does it accelerate? So in some sense, there'd be no quantum computing if Peter Shor hadn't shown that if you could build a quantum computer, it could factor large numbers which breaks a lot of public key cryptography. He also shows in that same paper that it allows you to calculate the discrete logarithm quickly, which breaks another set of uh, public key cryptography. Uh, my own interest is in quantum simulation, like how can we use a quantum computer to better understand molecules, materials, these sort of things. Uh, it's very good for problems with symmetries. Um, it can be used to do some linear algebra and optimization problems, but then you need some kind of more, um, you need more guarantees on the problem for it to be helpful. It can be used for unstructured search and give you a quadratic speed up. And if you want to learn all the things it can do, you can go to this website where they have all of the, all of the quantum algorithms, quantum algorithm zoo. Um, so why am I interested in quantum simulation? So when you think about quantum simulation, it really is critical for understanding things like chemistry, material science, um, yeah, yeah, engineering, nuclear physics, all these things. And if you look at any large computational center, for example, this is from the Argonne Leadership Computing Report, you see that actually a broad fraction of the biggest computers in the world are spent running quantum simulations. So if we could build an accelerator which speeds that up, life would be good. OK, how does it work? Um, so normally, I just like to start with the world's simplest model of a computer. <laughs> so state of a computer is just a string. It's just some number, a bit string. We'll, we'll even make it bits. Um, any operation on your computer, whether you're watching YouTube or recording this lecture or whatever, is just a map from bit strings to bit strings. That's it. So we'll just call it a function, um, but it could be any map. And then what's nice is we read out the bit string of the computer, the state of the computer. The bit string remains unchanged. And that's how we do work normally. So for a quantum computer, um, the state of a computer is a complex vector of unit length. So let's imagine there's a vector psi. It's a complex vector. Let's imagine that it's the sum of two vectors with these um, complex coefficients. And then it has to be unit length. 
So if we take the inner product of these vector, if the inner product of size one, operations on a quantum computer just map vectors to vectors. So in this higher dimensional space, we can just think of it as a rotation. So we rotate the vector from one space to another. Uh, the weird thing is readout changes the state. So if we measure in a, if we make a measurement which can distinguish A from B, and we'll assume these are just different bit strings so we can make that measurement, then the probability of getting out A is CA squared, and the probability of B is CB squared, and of course they sum to one because probability is conserved. Um, and we get either A or B, and we no longer have psi. So it's kind of remarkable that we can use these, this change of rules here to do anything different from up top. But the main reason we can do it really has to do with interference between these different uh, bit strings. Um, so I'm part of a expeditions in computing called EPIC. Uh, we've been making education materials at all levels. So Diana Franklin has been making these really nice zines. Uh, you can give them the zines. There are zines from anyone from grade school to practicing computer scientist. Uh, there's her cartoon Peter Shore, and there she is standing next to real Peter Shore, who's also part of this expedition. So if you have more questions about this, please. Um, consider looking at these materials. Okay, so now the question is, great, we've got this quantum processing unit, where is it? All right, so what are we gonna do with it? So I um, you know, have some goals. Uh, originally, I was gonna break cryptography to steal all the money out of the bank, but I've changed my mind and I'm gonna break cryptography so my students will quit talking about blockchain. That's my, that's my current dream. Um, physics models are interesting. Physicists are kind of like low, like they often are interested in like universal um, action and so sometimes the precision isn't so necessary. And then I'm really interested in simulating molecules um, because I guess my background in chemistry. So what does it cost to do these things? So the problem is um, our current devices have, you know, hundreds of qubits and they fail like 1% of the time. And the problems that I want to solve using complex molecules, they're going to take kind of a trillion operations, and then the good news is they only take about 1,000 qubits. So I don't have to build a machine that's that big in some sense. I only need 1,000 qubits. Uh, but this operation error is far from where we are right now. And so there have been a lot of estimates on how to do these computations better. You know, locally at Microsoft, a lot of work um, figuring out if we can make these quantum chemistry calculations easier. So you could hope that, well, this operation error is largely due to that classical electronics in the front. So I have to send in these RF signals and all these things to control my device. Maybe I can make that control better. But I think. Um, I think optimistically we could make it to 10 to the minus six. I think we will make it to 10 to the minus four. Um, we could think about improving these algorithms, right? So I can be very smart algorithmic designer and take this problem and make it take less operations, maybe at the cost of more qubits, maybe at the cost of less qubits. And I like this um, improvement because there's kind of a funny um, secondary problem, which is for quantum computers. So a classical, a big classical computer can simulate about 50 qubits. So if I get too low here, I basically turn my problem into something I can solve classically, which is great. That's actually a huge win for us, but it, it, it removes this problem as something you'd build a quantum computer for. So the idea on how to get out here, um, kind of the canonical idea, is we're gonna scale the hardware up till we have millions of quantum bits, and then we'll use quantum error correction to transform millions of noisy quantum bits into fewer, very high precision quantum bits. Um, so that's the goal. And so people can show that um, I could break, for example, RSA 2048 using about 10 to the 10 gates. Uh, 
sorry, that should be Gidney. Uh, Gidney and Akira showed that it would take 20 million physical qubits in about eight hours. So if you get to 20 million physical qubits, then um, you should become very nervous about your bank accounts, I guess. Um, all right. So how are we going to build these machines? Like, what are we going to actually build them out of? So there's actually tons of choices of, of quantum bits. Um, a lot of the early work was done with NMR because NMRs are like super useful machines that already had all the control systems, but they don't make the best quantum computers. Uh, you can make them out of anything that holds the quantum states, photons, neutral atoms, uh, quantum dots, uh, dopants in, in materials, atomic ions, superconducting qubits. Um, and at present, atomic ions and superconducting qubits um, are in my mind ahead because they have performed the most complex um, quantum processes so far. But everyone is not, yeah, no, no, everyone is, there's still space to go for sure. So um, when it comes to this idea of scaling hardware, there's kind of this divide between atoms and photons, uh, in which I'll put things like NV centers and atoms and photons, where you have like atomic systems that are pretty well defined. Uh, every single qubit is the same by nature. Nature makes the atoms the same. Um, there's usually weak coupling to the environment, but there's challenges in figuring out how to control and confine many of them. And so, for example, in ion traps, where I work uh, with, I wrote this paper recently with um, researchers at Lincoln Labs at Berkeley, where we just kind of dream about what would be the ideal sort of chips we could make if we could fabricate any sort of chips, and what we see is the problems there. On the solid state side, every qubit is the same up to manufacturing defects. And um, this manufacturing, you know, we're, <laughs> we can make great chips uh, for our classical devices, but the tolerances of making quantum devices are much, much harder. Um, as a result, there's this stronger coupling to the environment and small changes in, um, you know, layers, a few atoms moving um, could cause problems. But uh, my, my colleagues who work on this, they always say, well, we can print as many qubits as we want, right? We have these big fabs, I'll just print all these qubits. So I'm a huge fan of this paper, um, but snarkily, <laughs> why have they chosen only to print six? And in fact, there are only three qubits in this picture. Actually, there are only two qubits in this picture because they have to use three spins per qubit. So this printing as many as you can fit on a chip hasn't, hasn't panned out so far. So just looking at superconductors and trapped ions, uh, current state of the art, uh, superconducting qubits, we have these superconducting wires just as junctions. One qubit gates are microwaves. Two qubit gates are due to capacitive and inductive coupling. There are huge quantum simulators, you know, just north of us in British Columbia. Uh, this company, D-Wave, makes these 5,000 qubit devices. There are universal quantum computers of 55 qubits or so at Google and um, University of Science and Technology in China. 127 qubits announced at IBM. There are public cloud processors everyone can try out. Um, IBM, these startup companies, or Getty. Uh, yeah, these also startup companies. On trapped atomic ions, internal state of the atoms are the qubit. We use microwaves or lasers to control them. Um, I'm not really going to go too much into the details of trapped ion computing, but we can use the motion to create two qubit gates between them. Quantum simulators, there have been up to 300 qubits at NIST. Uh, universal quantum computers, um, kind of 20 qubits, 30 qubits at the time. Um, and there are public cloud processors available for ion traps as well from IonQ, Quantinuum, and Alpine Quantum Technologies. So then I just want to go a little bit more into some details about these two technologies. So superconducting qubits, um, the basic idea is you just have an LC oscillator. And that LC oscillator forms this harmonic well quantum mechanically. And then I have these, these quantum mechanically, I end up with these discretized states. Um, if we replace the inductor with the Joseph's injunction, the nonlinear inductance leads to an anharmonicity in the well. And it actually leads to quantization of magnetic flux through um, this LC oscillator. 
And this quantization of magnetic flux has been used for things like squid magnetometers for a long time. So the transmon is kind of the current state-of-the-art superconducting quantum computer, sorry, superconducting qubit. Uh, and it relies on a weak anharmonicity. What I find really interesting is there was a great um, review of technology for quantum computing in 2010 where they look at three different superconducting qubits in their main figure, none of which are the transmon. Transmon has already been invented, but it had not yet um, shown that its capability was better than these other methods. And as someone who doesn't do superconductors, what I thought was amazing was I used to go to conferences where these three groups would argue with each other about which one was best. And then one day in roughly 2011, 2012, I showed up and everybody was just using this. Right? And so I feel like that's, that's like an example of this sort of, um, one, this kind of technology leap that happens, uh, but two, that sometimes the, the winning technology at the time already exists, but we just don't know it. So what's great is they're kind of reaching the edge of what they can do with these transmons. And now people um, in, in universities, for example, this is, again, this nice, really nice review paper from Lincoln Labs, uh, from MIT Lincoln Labs. Uh, they basically are looking at ways to kind of extend the transmon to try to uh, reduce noise due to uh, charge defects, thermal noise, um, and, the, and basically this connects to these surfaces. That being said, using the transmon, uh, multiple companies were able to start to build devices. This is the IBM Quantum Experience. Um, yeah, this is not the original device. This has these six qubits. These are the transmons here. These are microwave lines which allow for control and readout. This is the same thing um, from the Martinez group before they moved from Google. Now they have capacitively coupled, um, yeah, these capacitively coupled transmons. Again, these microwave lines. And what I like about this period is that people would still show you the device. Like you can see the wires. Uh, you can see the, the, the different circuits. Um, you know that it's not quite scalable yet, right? Because this readout line, these readout and measurement lines are taking up a lot of space on this chip. And what we've seen in the last five years is now people present their devices like this. <laughs> so there's kind of like, these are again, these capacitively coupled uh, transmons. These are, um, yeah, these are coupled transmons, but now we just get these Device, pictures of circles and squares, and you have to, have to imagine what the circuit looks like. All right, so what about atomic ions? So atomic ions, um, we use, uh, this is a picture of ytterbium ions. There's about five microns between these lines. Uh, what's nice is you can see one atomic ion um, quite easily on a camera. Uh, here at University of Washington in Boris Splinov's lab, they trap barium. You can actually see one barium ion with your naked eye in a magnifying glass. That's how bright they are uh, due to laser-induced fluorescence. Uh, there's many possible atoms to pick. Um, they all have very good properties. Uh, my, my way to try to get that across is somehow all the startup companies in the US use ytterbium ions. Somehow all the startup companies in Europe use calcium ions. Is it because calcium is better in Europe? Do we have better ytterbium in the US? Not, it's not possible, right? So it's it really, they're, they're comparable. And so yeah, and so yeah, so Sarah's starting this calcium ion experiment. I have also calcium ion experiments. Um, how do we turn them into computers? Well, the basic idea is we have these complex surface electrode traps, um, which allow us to shuttle and hold many ions, and we can imagine having different types of zones, loading zones, section zone, memory zones. These things are made with very standard CMOS fabrication techniques, pretty standard CMOS fabrication techniques. This particular trap is from Sandia. To do the individual addressing, um, in my work uh, with Jung-San Kim and Chris Monroe, uh, we use a 32-channel AOM 
which is actually acousto-optic modulator, which is actually built to cut the, um, cut the masks to make regular classical circuits. Mm -hmm. So that, that's like a nice, it, it does a really lucky break that it turns out the laser that cuts masks to make regular classical computing circuits is a great laser for driving ytterbium. So we can just borrow all of that technology. So we, um, yeah, so we've been using this for both uh, an IARPA-based program to look at error correcting codes. Uh, I'm the director of this NSF stack collaboration. We're trying to make it open, um, like academic, open ion trap lab. Um, and then the Department of Energy has this QScout collaboration at, based out of Sandia, where if you want to run something on their um, QScout experiment, uh, I'm also part of that collaboration, uh, you can email them, and we, we actually just closed the last rounds of um, uh, round of proposals, but uh, we'll have them next year. So if we go back to this 2019 um, progress report, uh, this is where we were at that 2019. There is experimental quantum annealers, like the D-Wave device. There were small tens of qubits gate-based quantum computers. And there's this road map to getting to what we want to get to, right, which is large, large scale devices. So how have we been doing, right? So I don't know. Whenever people make these kind of trees, we should go back and see if progress has happened. So this first thing, um, uh, which is demonstrating a quantum computer can do anything faster than a classical computer, uh, was originally called quantum supremacy. Uh, Part of the community has moved to calling it quantum advantage. Um, the, the, what's nice is that basically happened that year, 2019, at Google. And then, um, again, the University of Science and Technology in China showed that it can work anywhere in the world in 2021. It wasn't a fluke. Uh, quantum error correction, which is going to be the rest of my talk, uh, is partially done. But what's been amazing is there's been this huge list of papers basically coming out since 2020. So before 2020, there are a couple things that are pushing there. And then since 2020, there's been kind of this deluge as basically our technology has become capable of, of almost getting there. Um, and it, I like it because it also shows that it's very repeatable. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, do I mean fault tolerance or do I mean one layer? Um, so this is one layer of quantum error correction. These circuits mostly are built in a fault tolerant manner, so, so, so faults don't spread wildly. Um, this Google paper um, is nice in that it shows a, both a distance three and a distance five surface code. Um, so they show a little bit of gain of going from distance three to distance five. Um, Many of these papers show an advantage in like one task. Um, and the reason why it's partial is no paper yet shows an advantage over all tasks. But I really, I, it's been almost like a, a phase transition in like how, what we can accomplish in the last couple years. Yeah, any other questions? Um, yeah, and then this one, which is getting to larger hundreds of qubit devices. So again, IBM has this 127 superconducting qubit Eagle processor, um, and Harvard recently has this, you know, 289 Rydberg atom qubits, uh, which is somewhere between a gate level um, and not. So, okay, so so what about where? Like, where can engineers come in? Where where what are what are the things we can do? Um, so I, I, this is my, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I gave a keynote at ISCA, so I was thinking of ISCA references, so I like this one, which is like, how can systems engineering help? So remember, quantum computing effectively starts in 1994 with Shor's algorithm. 10 years later, there's enough progress that there start to be a few papers in these top, top architecture conferences. Um, basically led by these pioneers, Vaik Chong, Fred Chuang, uh, John Kubiatowicz, Margaret Marnozzi, Mark Oskin, uh, Siri University of Washington at the time, uh, Van Meter, and Rod Van Meter. And then, 
you can see there is a huge gap. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, so this early period uh, was really about the cost of communication, and it recognized the need for using teleportation to get um, information around. This part, which I, I always call the first quantum winter, <laughs> Uh, during the first quantum winter, there are basically two papers. <laughs> uh, they include myself, Fred, Diana Franklin, and Margaret Marnozzi. Um, and then what happens? So what happens is in 2017, IBM makes these first, uh, these first computers available on the cloud. And since then, there's been this remarkable growth in people looking at how to architect and control these real devices. So um, I, myself, have been working on it um, for a long time. Uh, yeah, I, I've been interested in it for a long time. And I've had a really great time working with particularly Fred and Margaret and Diana. Um, so I just wanted to point out a paper from Margaret and my colleague Norbert Linke, where basically they write um, a compiler which helps optimize qubit mapping, gates and scheduling, and the optimization of the gates. And they actually apply it to three systems. They apply it to IBM's open chasm, uh, to IBM system. They apply it to Rigetti, which is the start of the company. And they apply it to Norbert's ion trap system at the University of Maryland. And I think what's great about this approach, right, is it actually helps all of them get better. The systems level approach works for all these things. And it pointed out to me that we have kind of this question of, of users, like who is using a quantum computer, and how can we give them um, access to all the pieces they need? So I always think there's someone who's like an algorithm runner. And so the algorithm runner just wants the answer to the problem. They don't actually care how the computer gets that answer, right? In some sense, um, yeah, yeah, it, we, we see this all the time, right? So if I need to optimize anything, I have a gazillion functions or machine learning techniques or anything I can use to do the optimization. But oftentimes, this user just cares that it's optimized or feels that it gives it a better answer than they started with. The second person I think of is kind of like, a, a quantum computing is kind of a circuit optimizer. So they actually want to be able to control every single piece of the hardware. They want to be able to control the RF pulse. They want to control uh, what the readout is. And, um, and this is kind of like a, a, real, a real tough challenge. And then there's also this like, group which ends up being kind of like a machine tester. And they want to basically be able to turn every possible knob. And is it actually feasible to get to that kind of, um, is it actually feasible to get to that kind of level? So we've been working on this um, in a collaboration with um, this expedition of computing called EPIC, this stack project, which has been building this academic ion trap quantum system with the goal of being a 32 qubit playground, which actually allows people to test new ideas and languages, compilers, and control. Um, my, yeah, my usual, what, one example is if I think about like a RISC architecture computer versus a CISC architecture computer, I could actually print those two different things and try them. In a quantum computer, you cannot print your, you can, you, you cannot print your quantum computer. Somebody has to have the fridge and all that stuff. And these um, companies, for, for good reason, right, will keep most of that information proprietary. And then you, if you're interested in, in trying to engineer at that level, it's, it's hard to interact. And so, our, so my, my goal is actually to try to build a user, cent, user center which doesn't just talk to the person running algorithms. It talks to people who are interested in optimizing all the places of this stack. All right, so, uh, you know, takes takes time. So um, towards that end, uh, we've been using this um, open source platform for control called Arctic. Um, it comes from a company called M Labs. Uh, 
It's basically gives you a way to sort of Python program FPGA processors in a way which is pretty reasonable uh, to create all kinds of RF in, out, and control. Um, this slide is old. There's a growing Arctic community uh, all across the world. Um, the, the, these, the groups up top have actually contributed some to pay M Labs to develop certain features. Uh, my group has been working on this um, Duke Arctic Extensions. This work has been mostly led by my student, uh, Leon Rizabos, who just graduated uh, and took a job at INQ. Um, the, just as an example of kind of things you can do, is um, when, when, when experimentalists in a laboratory uh, try to optimize their quantum computer, they have an idea of, okay, there's the calibration routines I'll do, step by step by step by step. Um, but we can actually put these into something like a directed acyclic graph, and then the calibration jobs can have some sort of dependency. And then we can actually really increase the uptime of our quantum computer by, um, by basically not doing calibration unless we really have to, which sounds obvious. But because we do this all within this DAX framework, anyone uh, can take this schedule, if they, if, right, they have to use Arctic, then they have to agree to our framework, um, but then they can use it to automatically calibrate their systems. And then I think there's a lot of interesting research questions about like, Given your actual system, what is the best kind of graph to pick? What's the best way to hunt through those graphs to find them? Um, pretty open. And then we know that at Google, they use a similar, they, 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 they show that they use this um, uh, directed acyclic graph to control these things, but we, we don't have access, of course, to their <laughs> control hardware and software. Uh, recently, uh, last month, uh, Leon won the best paper award for building a function, functional simulation of basically these Arctic software, Arctic hardware and software. And it turns out that this functional simulator, which doesn't require you to uh, accept the rest of our framework, but just gives you a way to functionally simulate this device from this open source company, uh, has been our most light, widely adopted feature. So people across the world are using it. All right. So second thing, um, and why I think it's really great to bring in like a systems level engineering approach to these things is that often people building these devices are trained as physicists. And um, physicists basically believe in n equals one or n equals infinity. And they know either one is the best or infinity is the best. And in ion traps, it's kind of the same thing. They say, oh, we need two ion, four ion chains. So this is a nice paper from Oxford with like really high fidelity uh, fills 0.1% two cubic gates. And um, in, in, in work with Jung Sung Kim, we've been working on two ion chains to get really high fidelity two cubic gates. But we actually don't know what the longest possible chain could be. So Chris Monroe, uh, this is an example of a quantum simulator pushing to sort of 50 qubits. And in some uh, work with my student James Lung, you know, we actually don't think there's any in principle reason why you couldn't get this kind of fidelity on a 50 ion chain. Just right now in practice, we can't. So then what's great about working some joint work with Margaret, which I like, <laughs> is that uh, her, her student Prakash and my student Tripto, uh, but this is mostly Prakash's work, basically said, well, that's crazy. Obviously, <laughs> chain length, Optimal chain length depends on all kinds of things. And what they found was the, we, what we found was the optimal chain length depends on our error model, what the connectivity between our different kind of ion trap gates are. Uh, we had different, slightly different timing models based on the pulse forms for the two qubit gates. And the surprising thing for, for me was actually different choices for different algorithms. And the basic reason has to do with uh, parallelism. So this different amount, yeah. Does that increase the, let's say, the gate error? So is the gate error per gate dependent on the size of the system? 
Yeah, so, so the question is, um, does the gate error depend on the chain size? And so what I can tell you is, um, in principle, the answer is no. But in practice, the answer is yes. So in practice, the best, best gates we've had have been on small ion chains. So the next question is about threshold theorem. So the threshold theorem says that if I could build a large enough error correcting code, I can make my errors arbitrarily small. But to get a large enough error correcting code, I need many, many, many ions. Um, so, so my claim is that that will not happen in a single chain. You will need many chains, no matter what. And so then you need, then you need an architecture, which is, this is the cartoon of, where you have four separate ion chains. And then you need some way to get information between the different chains. But that's great. So um, yeah, so in the last five minutes, I just wanted to say a tiny bit about uh, quantum error correction. OK, so uh, yeah, obviously, I'm just trying to give a colloquium talk without too many technical details. I could talk your ear off about technical details all day long. Uh, I can start right now. Uh, one thing my group has been working a lot on is thinking about different types of ways to make error correcting codes. And so we've been looking at extensions of kind of known codes, of, of shore codes, bacon shore codes, surface codes, um, and derived a whole set of codes uh, we call compass codes, which enable us to, um, uh, yeah, actually enable us to like move between these different pieces. Um, they also allowed us to make very fast error correction decoders because we needed, we basically had a, an unlimited number of codes to test, and so we needed much faster decoders to test them numerically. Um, it sort of ruined my breakfast during the pandemic because uh, the, the bacon reminded me of vegan bacon shore. And then this one, the decoder of a, of a, of a, quant, a, decoder of a quantum of a surface code you could think about it, you have these blueberries and these bananas, and you want to find links that link them together. And so if I could figure out where these different links were, I could solve these things. So what's been great is these kind of compass codes, including the short codes with Norbert Linke, we just did some demonstrations of like longer short codes. IBM implemented a type of compass code called heavy hex code, which better matched their heavy hexagon lattice. And of course, surface code predates the idea of compass codes. Um, but there have been many papers now showing surface codes with these surface electrodes. For the ion traps, um, we've been working, again, this is work with Chris Monroe's group, which has now moved to Duke. This is a picture of the black box, where inside there is this ion trap with all these ions. There are 32 outputs to measure all the ions independently, 32 inputs to control them all independently. Um, it was during the pandemic, uh, these are the students working with Chris, who basically just worked at home um, and controlled this. Uh, Marco and Crystal were both research scientists and postdocs who have now joined us as faculty at Duke. We were able to show um, this Bacon Shore experiment, uh, which was the uh, first experiment that could, had all of the qubits necessary to detect and correct both type, all types of errors on this simple code. Um, yeah. But obviously, we need to figure out how to scale up. So in ion traps, there's kind of two pictures, a picture of photonic interconnects between these different ion links, which could be their own traps. There could be shuttling between these different scenarios. And both of these pictures are for the surface code. It requires a better integration of devices. We need ways to really deliver on-chip optics and get these signals in and out. And what I'm most excited about is the last couple uh, years, there's been a huge breakthrough in finite rate codes. And what these finite rate codes tell us is that if we could figure out how to compute with them, we could go from something that takes 1,000 qubits per logical qubit to something that takes 50 qubits for logical qubit. And so this is a nice example of this thin planar code uh, from, from Microsoft. 
where they kind of give you a sense of how you, you can get around these things. So scaling, in my mind, is like the current challenge. Uh, connectivity is a real problem, and we need to think about how to get around this bandwidth and rate. I think we need to start thinking about heterogeneous systems where different parts of the quantum computer do different things, have something like maybe memory hierarchies. Um, and then I think these finite rate codes are really like a new opportunity to think of, of new architectures and things. Um, this is just a few of my students who were involved in the, the, the error correction work um, who mostly left. <laughs> so Dripto and Mike left my lab, went to Google, implemented this distance five code. <laughs> Natalie left my lab, went to Quantinium, did the first uh, error corrected logical C naught that beats a physical C naught. Leon went to IBM, worked on the heavy hex code. Uh, I really should have made them all sign things to never do work better than me, uh, but I didn't do it. Yeah, Catherine uh, was an undergrad who just started her MIT PhD. Shilin will be looking for a postdoc next year, or you should just hire him as a faculty member. Skip that thing. And then Narayanan, who a, 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 was a grad student of Robert Calderbank and Henry Pfister, um, just started his faculty position at the University of Arizona. And then I'll just say, um, at Duke, we now have this big Duke Quantum Center. These are all of the students and Jared and his faculty members. Uh, we're very grateful for support from National Science Foundation, Army Research Office, IARPA, and the DOE. Thanks. Are there any questions from the audience? Go for it. Oh, yeah, here, uh, you in the white shirt, sir. Okay, yeah. Thanks for the very insightful talk. Do you have any insights or opinions on 2D ion crystals, which is sort of the local speciality? Yeah, so the question is about two dimensional ion crystals. Uh, so, 2D ion crystals give you some advantage in that you can have more ions within one chamber. Um, the largest uh, quantum simulation experiments now are done in 2D ion crystals. Um, for example, these penning trap 300 qubit crystals. Um, I think, yeah, so, so I, I feel like, what, I guess what I'm most worried about right now is like connecting crystals to crystals. And so I, the 2D ion crystal is great because I can do control on a larger number of ions in one space. Um, but I, I don't think it helps solve the question of how I connect it to the next bunch of crystals. One of the things that I'm very interested in, right, is the, the possibility of transporting qubits between computers, right, which is best done with, I guess, photons. Yeah. Uh, what kind of information do you have about that, like the ability to like operate on photons or to, to transmit them? I remember reading a thing about a company trying to commercialize some sort of relay system because there, there is a limit to how far you can send a photon through optical fiber. Yeah, yeah, so, so first on the idea of photons as carriers of quantum information, um, there is an object called a quantum repeater. And, and building quantum repeaters remains challenging. And thinking about how to set up a network of quantum, quantum repeaters which allows you to continue mapping it through the fiber is tough, but we should think about it. The second thing has to do with, um, I mean, obviously didn't have any time to talk about how quantum teleportation works. But the neat thing about quantum teleportation is you generate these entangled pairs between two separate spaces. And that entangled pair has kind of no information. It's just a generic state. And if I measure it locally, I just get a random state with no information. Um, but I can use those entangled pairs to create an effective link, right? So I kind of imagine um, in a short network, we would use these, we'd use photons to generate these entangled links and then link things. And then in a long network, I would need these quantum repeaters so I could actually generate entangled photons at a larger distance. Does that answer your question? One of my thoughts on it, was that you might not be able to link a photon 
from one machine all the way, you know, say from coast to coast, but could you link a series of machines that then run and operate or operations similar to something like Tor, where then it's you gain the same sort of security, right? Because of course you can't mess with a quantum photon, right? Like the same way you can in the intercept of packet. Yeah, so the um so you could think of like a quantum repeater as a small computer that just does the node. Um, if I wanted to build like the distributed quantum computer that you're considering, then the main challenge has to do with the bandwidth. So if I want the sum of these distributed quantum computers to be as powerful as if they were all in one space, then I actually need a large bandwidth of entangled pairs to have that power. And if I only have like a thin, connection, like one entangled pair between them, um, I don't get that much extra gain over having just one. So yeah, I think, I think people are working on distributed quantum computers. I think there are a lot of good, um, actually they're kind of amazing security protocols using distributed quantum computers based on blind quantum computing. Um, so I think people will work on that. But I think the challenge right now is like the bandwidth between that available to connect these two devices is not as high as we need. Oh, we'll just move on for a second, sorry. Yeah. Hi, so could you explain a little bit more about why practically the longer qubit chain would create more errors? Yeah, so the question is, why does a longer qubit chain create more errors? Um, so, um, in a, so one place that errors occur in an ion trap quantum computer has to do with uh, heating rates. So the ion, there's some, some surface somewhere. In this case, it's like 70 microns away, the ion floats above. Um, there'll be some heating rate from that surface onto this chain. Now the way that we uh, do gates, we use the radial modes of the ions. And that radial confinement um, doesn't really care about chain length. However, um, the axial confinement, um, if we want to not buckle into a two-dimensional crystal, if we actually want to keep a single chain, we have to make that weaker and weaker and weaker. And so the ions, the frequency of the ions sloshing around gets lower and lower and lower. And because, unfortunately, all of these heating rates have some like 1 over f kind of noise, or worse, as these things get lower, the ions like move back and forth. And, um, and, then, and then one way to think about where the error comes from is because they're moving a little bit more back and forth, the laser isn't quite hitting them right. right? So that's a common place the, this, this error can happen. Um, but again, uh, it's not, it's like a, <laughs> it's a technical error. So I could imagine getting this heating noise lower. Or I could imagine putting in ions that sympathetically cool it so I can keep the chain kind of more stable. Um, but in practice right now, that's like one of the things which limits us. No, yeah, yeah, so, so the idea is if we, if we knew what, what the noise was doing, we could maybe just track the laser as the crystal moves. Um, it, it, yeah, there's a scenario where that would more or less work, but the problem is that noise is actually kind of stochastic, and we don't have a good way to like watch, uh, you know, to, to carefully measure in situ. Yeah. Um, so for quantum chemistry problems, so you're not really interested in um, a quantum dynamic limit. So there's just some finite size that is interesting. Yeah. So what kind of finite size? Well, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So here's a, here's 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 a funny. This is a personal example from my own work. So outside of quantum computing. 
I like to use the tools of quantum computers to build better sensors to measure the properties of molecular ions. I was measuring a very simple molecular ion, calcium H+. The problem is no one had ever measured it before. And so I measured a line which disagreed from my colleague's calculation using very good methods by 700 wave numbers, uh, which is a lot. Um, it's a weird unit, but anyway, 700 wave numbers. My colleague, who is a computational chemist, David Sherrill, he's very good, was so mad, he like went to the next level of, of, of accuracy, and then the error was still 350 wave numbers. So that is a chemistry kind of, that, if you're a chemist, this is something you care about because it, because the methods we have now cannot achieve spectral accuracy. They can give us kind of an accuracy which tells us whether things will work or not work at room temperature. But if I wanted to, say, predict the spectrum of molecules in outer space to better understand interstellar spectra, it's not good enough. Now, of course, uh, you can't make money doing that, I don't think. If you know how to, let me know. Uh, <laughs> The, the other thing that people bring up, and this is like what Microsoft has pushed on a lot, has to do with catalyst. So particularly in, um, in biological systems, catalytic center is actually very hard to calculate why it works because, the, um, because you have many, many electrons. And even though it's a finite number, it's beyond our current capabilities. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so what happens now is if, you, if you're an inorganic chemist and you make a new catalyst, you can go to your theory friend, and they can do some calculations and draw a picture and tell you how it works. But you can't go to your theory friend and ask them to calculate which of these will be better catalysts. That doesn't work, right? And the hope is, with a quantum computer, you'd actually start to be able to do that, which is then useful for all kinds of industrial processes, and we can make a lot of money. I won't have to break into people's mix. I think that's all the time that we have. Thank you, everybody, for listening. See you next week. Uh, and if you have more questions, you can come down.